Welcome to the Fresh RN Podcast. The information contained in this podcast is meant to supplement your existing knowledge and not replace it. Always refer to your state board of nursing, standards of care, and respective institutions' policies to guide your practice. All identifying patient details have been changed to protect their privacy and remain compliant with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Thanks, nurses. Stay fresh. Trust your gut. True scientist versus pragmatist. My time is so At least I won't say anything that's not backed by evidence. Not always true for Tom. I'll call it her recommendation. So people actually do listen to what we say sometimes. You know, it, it's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> podcast. I am Katie Kleber and I'm Melissa Stafford and we're really excited today because we have some guests that we fangirl over a little bit. Very true. <laughs> um, so we're recording here at NTI 2017 and we've, we've each been to three NTIs. That's true. And every single time we've seen these two lecture. Oh my to, gosh. Yeah yeah <laughs> it's serious. Uh-huh. I think last time there were 900 people in the room yeah. And I think this time you guys have 1,200 seats. Yeah, yeah. we got some new twists, too. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> really cool stuff. <laughs> so, so this is Mike Ackerman. He is the Associate Director and Professor at Niagara University School of Nursing and the Principal Owner of Ackerman Consulting. Dr. Ackerman obtained his BSN from Niagara University and his MSN and DNS from State University of New York at Buffalo. Um, and his postmaster's acute care nurse practitioner at the University of Rochester. And then Dr. Tom Ahrens yep. is a research scientist at Barnes Jewish in St. Louis. He's a national expert on um, sepsis and has published extensively with five books and more than 50 papers. So thank you guys so much for joining us. It's our pleasure. Yes, thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we, uh, we just want to kind of jump in. Let's do it. So can you guys give us kind of a basic definition of sepsis for the new nurse? I'll do that one if you want. It's sometimes hard for Mike. Yeah. I, but the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you'll see we'll do this the whole interview. <laughs> <laughs> sepsis is the body's response to an infection. It's very simple. The complexity is out of this world, though. There's been no cure for sepsis. We have nothing for it. We have supportive care. Mm -hmm. We've spent billions of dollars trying to figure this out. Uh, So when you look at a definition of sepsis, when I just said that, it's it's very misleading. But we know it starts with an infection. Mm -hmm. So 99% of infections or more, our body handles marvelously. But every once in a while, something happens. And when it does, it, it's terrible. One of my favorite quotes from last year was, um, the people don't die from infection, they die from the body's response to mm-hmm. infection. That's exactly right. And I, I thought, you know, it's such a simple statement, so to speak, but it, I think I, I hope that that reflects the complexity that is sepsis, really. It does. We've known that for over 100 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the quotes we use is from... Uh, I think it's from Osler back in yeah. like 1903 or something like that. So we've known this a long time. Well, I didn't realize that wow. it was known for that. I didn't realize that. Yeah. But one of the, one of the quotes that you guys said, um, I think I think I think you said it, it was, um, if you imagine sepsis is like the immune response on the dashboard, the, the handles on the dashboard or knobs, and you turn it all the way up, yeah. and then you rip the knobs off. Yeah. And there's just no controlling the body's response. That's right. To this infectious, or not the, or the immune response. Right. So yeah, people actually right. do listen to what we say sometimes. You know, it, it's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> really. Well, that was a few years ago, and I thought that was the, the best, that was such a simple way to put it, and I've used that to explain to other nurses that. It's simple, yeah. but it's very accurate. Yeah. Because uh, once, once it starts, we don't know how to stop it. Yeah. And it's not just inflammation. The, um, and we talked about this as well. The, we use criteria, the SERS criteria, right. to identify when sepsis occurs. Now there's controversy over, is that enough? But when Roger Bone, who proposed that, actually based on the steroid studies of the 80s, he said it's not that simple. There's also cars and Mars. 
Cars is a counter anti inflammatory response syndrome, and Mars is a mixed anti inflammatory response syndrome. He said there'll never be one treatment for sepsis. It depends on the phase that it's in. So that's when, when Mike talks about ripping the knobs off, he's right, because <clears throat> we don't know what phase it is. Wow. And one of the things before we jump into some other questions, um, I wanted to see, because I had seen recently in the last year studies, or I don't even I don't know if it, I've gone into like formal studies yet, but the, what was it, vitamin, the, vitamin that. C. <laughs> I, I heard that and I was like, like in <laughs> we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, really? That'll be part of the lecture? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that was Dr. Merrick. Um, he's in Virginia someplace. Came out with, a, and a, again, we'll talk about it tomorrow, but basically, um, in theory, it makes sense by giving vitamin C, antioxidants, um, thiamine, I think it was thiamine, and, um, and corticosteroids, and oh, yeah. low dose steroids. So, in theory, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, probably not that simple, but retrospectively, they they looked at it and found a reduction in mortality. But w there's there's a lot of controversy around that. So, and the danger is that if people abandoned some of our conventional therapy and just jumped to that, there's a big risk at that because it hasn't been studied. But um, and again, we'll. We'll spar on this tomorrow a little bit. Um, <laughs> the true scientist versus the pragmatist. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, because I thought the, the headlines I saw from, and it wasn't a research article, it was a news outlet, yeah. makes it sound like this cure. Absolutely, it, it does. Which is very deceiving, because then you start having family members that are like, Absolutely. why are they getting vitamin C? That's exactly right. And that's the danger. And I've never seen anything in sepsis picked up by the lay media like this did. This was shocking. This yeah. this was a beautiful PR piece. Really? Um, because everybody picked it up. Yeah. You know, written, internet, on TV. So, but um, you got to be cautious mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to go into some different viewpoints because people listening are going to be all brand new nurses. So, and a lot of new nurses are starting in the emergency department mm -hmm. and in the critical care setting and and naturally in med surge, but the big deal with sepsis is um, early recognition. So what, if you have your ED, your brand new ED nurse in front of you, what um, what does good sepsis care for that ED nurse, for that patient that has potentially sepsis? Like what does that practically look like for a brand new ED nurse? The, uh, <clears throat> the key is recognition. I mean, if, and we'll talk about this, we always do. You've got to recognize it. It's not simple, it's kind of vague, but anybody with an infection should trigger an alarm. They can mess with sore throat. I rule them off for sepsis mm. because we have people die of sore throats because it morphs into sepsis. Mm -hmm. Not often, but if it happens once, that's too many times for us. Yeah. And so and for our, our new nurses, they never want to see that happen. We look at people with a cut on their leg from a gym injury. Yeah. And That's, dies. That was the whole Rory Stoughton case that really precipitated New York going to mandatory reporting. Young kid comes in with just a just a, what appears to be a superficial wound mm -hmm. and um, some upper or some GI symptoms and gets sent home after being worked up and uh, is dead four days later. Um, so to the ED, the new ED nurse, it's. You know, trust your trust your intuition. Although new nurses don't always have a lot of it, but if you think it's wrong, mm -hmm. follow it up. Vital sign. Use your assessment skills. Mm -hmm. You know, use what you graduated with. Vital assessment skills, and like uh, Tom said, if they have an infection or or even suspected infection, there's a, a case that I won't discuss here because I think um, somebody else is going to discuss it later this week, but. Um, some one of our nurses that speaks here, his husband, got septic from flossing his teeth. Um, what? <laughs> yeah, because you know who that is. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't I say the name. Any friends with floss their teeth. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Tom. You guys stand really far away because the yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, too much. yeah. <laughs> but so so that's it. If, if you suspect infection and you got. Uh, you know, your vital signs are messed up, 
they, they, you got to push that to the next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. And then one of the things, and so because we're, our experience mainly is with critical care, so we get the patient from the ED. Correct. So the, the, my tiny soapbox is also drawing those cultures and labs before you start the antibiotics, but you have that very That's short right. period of time to start the antibiotics, so that means you got to work really, really fast. Well, that like golden hour, right? right? Right, absolutely. If you're drawing cultures, you better draw lactate, mm -hmm. and while you're at it, get a pro-calcitonin level. There you go. Those are ways that you can help protect the patient. Yeah. Uh, the whole, like Mike said, is the vital signs are key. So search criteria, they're not perfect, but they will warn you mm -hmm. if something's wrong. And then the other thing is listen to the patient or family member. Are they acting different? Mm -hmm. Like with Rory, GI symptoms, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Something was wrong there. Uh, our good friend Carl Flatley, whose daughter Erin died, you know, of a hemorrhoidectomy or following hemorrhoidectomy. They went into the emergency room and they discharged her. That's a problem. Something was missed. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't help that they didn't want to give her antibiotics. But the point being is that the ER nurse, literally, I've seen this, they've saved people's lives yeah. because they picked it up early. Once they get to us in the intensive care unit, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. The emergency room nurse has one of the hardest jobs of them all because they, they get a ton of things that won't be sepsis. Yeah. But they can't miss the one that is. Yeah. And, and in uh, teaching nurse practitioner students, we say you can't afford to miss the things you can't afford to miss. So yeah. that's profound. one thing you can't afford to miss. It is profound, I know. Um, but but uh, you got to look for the things that will kill somebody first. And, and after you've ruled that out, mm -hmm then look for other uh, hypotheses of what might be wrong. But sepsis is one of those things we can't afford to miss. And ICU nurses actually, um, they have it easy. Yeah, from we, that big picture. Yeah, okay. because by that time we usually have a diagnosis while they're in the ICU. Mm -hmm. These poor ED nurses or the nurses that work in the nursing home or on the floors, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have all the tools, they don't have all the people around them, and that's where they really need their skills, their assessment skills, and, and just their their gut about this isn't right. And, it, and Tom brings up a good point too, that is, especially with maybe the elderly or kids, listen to the family. Mm -hmm. Because that, they, they'll say he's just not right, and they're they tell right. They that you should listen. That's, yeah. just, that's a huge red flag. Mm -hmm. That's almost, in my opinion, as important as a search criteria. Mm -hmm. Listening to the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they know them. And they know them, absolutely. Yeah, they know the child, they know the behavior. They that's know right. their mom or dad, and even if they have dementia, they know the typical behavior yeah. Yeah. Um, to if be they, able to communicate them. Yeah, if they say something like they've been sleeping a lot, that scares me. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing that? Yeah. I'm worried central nervous system involvement. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that flows into, you know, my next one is, so now, like, the more challenging aspect is, let's say, the med, med surge nurse. A lot of brand new nurses are in that role. And I, and I was, I was a cardiac step down a little bit med surge, but I did have some instances where I wasn't really, sepsis, I didn't really understand that well when I graduated. And then I saw some other patients have it, and then I actually had a, a scenario where I had a patient that had those nonspecific signs, and I was... Um, calling the physician and oh and they're kind of explaining away all of my concerns yeah, yeah. and it got to the point where I couldn't wake the patient up I had to do like sternal pressure and then I was like I'm calling a code on your patient and I ended up doing that and well congratulations the from the EDBS right <laughs> but I don't, well, the, I don't um, know. here's a little soapbox oh I love soapboxes the, yeah. um, do you think that the leading cause of death should be well taught in nursing schools absolutely What's the leading cause of death? Sepsis. Sepsis. And you graduate and don't know much about sepsis? Mm -hmm. I'm shocked, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Well, yeah. it's, it's also, it's a comment on some of our academic institutions that the faculty probably don't know that much about <laughs> well, it either. <laughs> well, I won't get into the, the <laughs> curriculum to spend two months on orthopedics mm -hmm. and couple of days on sepsis. My, my students get it. Because you're good. Well, <laughs> I try. But that's, and that's the problem. And the other issue 
tied in directly in, if that is the physicians, do they know it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem for family members as well as nurses who try and tell their doctor something's wrong mm -hmm. and the doctor says, don't worry about it. Right. So I picture the nurse like on the floor who has a patient who's diagnosed with a UTI, say, and they mm -hmm. now have low blood pressure, right? So their pressure's in the 80s and um, you know, Nana is 90 years old and tiny, so maybe that's normal, but it's not normal for that patient. And That's a good point. You know, I, I think that it's a challenge for a nurse to call a physician and say, you know, my, my patient's blood pressure is low, um, and, you know, what do we need to do? And, of course, nine times out of ten, it's giving fluid. Let's give them a bolus and see yeah. how they respond yeah, to that. So <laughs> yeah. But, in, you know, later on, of course, hypotension is very significant, or can be very significant yep. in sepsis. But to me, I wonder, in hindsight, in my time on med surge, is, you know, what was I missing before that? Was it a fever or maybe a low temperature? Or, Could be. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a doctor once tell me once I moved to ICU that the patients who come in with sepsis that have low temperatures worry him more than the patients that come in with sepsis that have fevers. And, you know, I just wonder what your take is. No, I mean, I think that's, that's a legitimate point. I don't know it's true but i know it's legitimate if you have a low temperature your immune system is not responding appropriately so that's that's important yeah there it's it goes along with low white blood cell count too correct if they it's called energy so if they if they can't elicit an energic response uh, their own immune response mm -hmm. that's very troublesome mm -hmm. and um, i don't know if there's any data on that mm -hmm. um but it is very troubling if they have low low temperature and low low white blood cell count because they're losing the battle mm -hmm. and the body's just not keeping up and and you'll see that in oncology patients yeah who yeah, won't be sense. able to respond but to the point being is <clears throat> when you have someone ninety years old and they're showing those symptoms the first question I was asked do the, does the patient have an advanced directive. Uh, I want to know that before oh, I really get I into this. I love that that was your first result. <laughs> <laughs> because this can get bad quickly, mm -hmm. and we can pour a ton of resources into this, mm -hmm. but is that what the patient wants? Mm -hmm. So, you know, example we give, an 84-year-old man comes to us in the emergency department with a perfed bowel from a nursing home, severe mm -hmm. dementia. The surgeon can fix that. They can Absolutely. fix the perf bowel. They can fix the perf bowel. Can they fix the dementia? No. Mm -hmm. No. All we do is we'll send them back to the nursing home. Mm -hmm. So I told that to the family. The surgeon was mad at me because he wanted to do the operation. Yeah. But it isn't what the patient wanted. That's mm -hmm. what the family told me. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the key. So it depends what age group you're talking with. And we sepsis is worse than, you know, older people. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. But... You need to always ask that question because this is a sometimes a, a horrific situation we're getting ourselves into. Remember, you're too young to probably have heard this quote, but pneumonia was called an old man's best friend because that's what they die of. Really? Yeah. I didn't, I've never heard that. But they didn't mm -hmm. die of pneumonia. They died of sepsis. They died of sepsis. Interesting. Wow. So for the nurse that's working on a med surge floor, and is there anything that you think they should look for before you get that? Hypotension. Well, hypotension is late. Yeah. Isn't and by the yeah. time we get a hypotension, we're in the shock stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you bring up a good point because a lot of clinicians, that's when they recognize sepsis. Yeah, that makes me think. As we're, we're neuro nurses, that's like the that's like waiting for pupillary changes. It absolutely right? is. Late, that's right. You've missed something. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes sepsis goes quick. Sometimes it doesn't. But the surge criteria usually give you a clue. Not always, but usually. But if you're in any doubt of a patient, get a lactate. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. see if it's elevated. Just draw the lactate. It's simple, it's simple, cheap. Mm -hmm. Tells you a lot. You can be fooled by normal, but um, yep, can't be. Usually, can't be fooled by a high one. That's right. right. So would it, be, um, would it be like, let's say you've got that med surgeon nurse that's calling the physician. They're thinking it might be sepsis. They don't. They're not getting that response. Can do you suggest say, hey, what if we just get a lactate? 
Absolutely. And that's maybe the be the proactive. Slip in, Absolutely. I'll just get a lactate. Would that be okay? Kind of verbiage. Is that like a way? And then if it does come back elevated, hey, I've got solid. That's right. Information to yeah. go off of versus like you know something else. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's a tool. And if they come back about cost, these are cheap tests. Mm -hmm. You know, they're ten dollars. Yeah, oh. actually, there's some places that have a a scripted S bar. Really? For possible sepsis, and in their S bar, in their S bar, the recommendation is: What do you think about getting blood cultures, mm -hmm. drawing a lactate, and maybe starting some fluid? So, organizations that get it have taken that next step to say: Let's make it as seamless and yeah. easy as possible for nurses to to treat these patients. So, here's a scripted S bar. You know, and you fill in the blanks, mm -hmm. um, you know, the age and the whatever um, diagnosis. But in the end, it's what do you think about this, 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 and this? And that kind of it takes the pressure off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, when I was in that, I didn't, even, I didn't even know what to suggest at that point because I was new and I didn't really understand that stuff that I really should have. But I didn't, I, I, I knew something needed to be done, but I didn't know what it was. So I didn't, I don't know. I just didn't know what to do, and I felt kind of helpless. But that's so lactate, blood cultures, any fl fluid, any other ones that you like. Well, procalcitonin is is good for bacterial infections. Okay. And I won't rule out a viral or fungal or anything like that. But the vast majority of sepsis is from a lower respiratory tract infection. Oh, okay. So if they come in in the ED with that, you you're going to see like Mike saying these scripted prompts that will help you say. Should I do this? Mm -hmm. And procalcitonin, the evidence is really increasing that they should be doing that. Yeah, five years ago, we really didn't talk much about That's procalcitonin because right. it was still still kind of out there. And we, at least I won't say anything that's not backed by evidence. Not always true for Tom, but... Um, <laughs> but uh, that's because I'm a visionary. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but now the, the procalcitonin... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now procalcitonin, the literature on procalcitonin is becoming more and more convincing that that should probably be in your screening mm -hmm. um, repertoire okay. of things to do. And um, I know uh, I order it if um, if I suspect it. So, so kind of you know, if if you're on a med search floor and your patient starts showing signs of any kind of infection, a nurse in the back of their mind should really kind of be looking at, is this going to turn into sepsis? That's right. Exactly. exactly. Now, the confusing part for the nurses on the floor is what if they're already on antibiotics? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, what you're looking at is a worsening situation. And that's one of the things that we've seen. It's very hard to tell what, you know, what else is happening when they're already being treated. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why I like to get the procalcitonin levels. Because if it's elevated, and what the research shows is if you're able, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, but if the research shows you get an 80% drop in the procalcitonin level, or you know something in the range like that, that your antibiotic's working. Mm. But if I'm on the floor or something and that's not happening, even the ICU, if the person's not getting better, what's your procalcitonin level doing? That's why I'd like to get them regularly. Because mm. it's a guide, is your antibiotic therapy working or not? Um, you know, they could be on the floor and get a second infection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it wouldn't just be the initial one. Mm -hmm. And maybe that initial antibiotic's not the right one. Mm -hmm. That's also what the procalcitonin will tell you. If it's not coming down, maybe right. you need a different antibiotic. Do you, is there evidence out there that suggests um, facilities that have like a rapid response team, having those nurses come to help evaluate has increased... Um, recognition of sepsis a little earlier or I don't know if there's data on that I I think I know anecdotally um, when we rolled out our sepsis program and sepsis became one of the rapid response calls we did see uh, more recognition of it more more admissions to the ICU mm -hmm. that's it's just anecdotal mm -hmm. but we but did I think see that's that good data. I do believe in that yeah the rapid response team the floor nurse needs help. Yeah. They that's why calling the rapid response team whenever they're uncomfortable is a smart thing to do. Yeah. 
so empowering each other to do that. It absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. the realm. You know, rapid response nurse, if your facility doesn't have one, is really someone who's typically an experienced critical care nurse yep. that has a, a pretty good grasp of the various, especially most common disease processes, um, that may be able to help you recognize and or think through what's going on with your patient. Right. So, you know, maybe you're a new nurse and this first time you don't really think of sepsis, but once you have that call with the rapid response nurse, moving forward, maybe it's something that you pick up on a little bit earlier. Absolutely. So, I mean, they're a, a wonderful resource to have and use them. I recommend use them. Mm -hmm. And in the facility that I work, there's actually criteria in the rapid response policy that if, you know, if your oxygenation requirement exceeds X, then you should have a rapid response yeah. call. If Very your blood good, pressure yeah. is this, you need to have a rapid response call. So it, it helps give you some guidelines on when to engage in that, re that resource. And, and a lot of times rapid response teams can have their own policies and protocols where it's like, okay, so we think this is sepsis and we can work within this policy to get a lactate and then call. Yes. Yeah, correct. So that way we're expediting care. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or getting an ABG and right. then having a lactate added on to that. Right, so, right. And then being able that's to right. provide more like quantitative data to the physician when you're calling. Mm -hmm. um, so let's move, now that we're talking a little more ICU, so let's say the patient is in ICU um, and does have, we know they have sepsis. Um, what kinds of things should that brand new nurse in the ICU, and hey, they've got a severely septic patient, they're a new nurse, um, what kinds of things um, have changed recently, I guess? You know, when I, when I, that's a big question, I know. When I started, <laughs> it was CVP, and now it's all <laughs> NICOM, and I know you guys hate CVP. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we hate CVP for a measure of fluid resuscitation. In heart surgery, you have to have the CVP, because you do look at the pressure in the right, the right side of the heart, and... Right ventricular failure, that's your first sign of, of right ventricular failure is a high CVP. But to use it as a indicator of preload mm -hmm. is just not right. Um, and in fact, the new guidelines came out and they've eliminated the CVP. Oh, wow. Um, so uh, if you come tomorrow, you'll see, uh, uh, can I give it away? We, go, go ahead. We're not doing this tonight. Okay, this so, later. so <laughs> we took a slide. I was in St. Louis about a month ago, and we took a slide of, of Tom. Um, and on the slide, it says sepsis treatment in like 1999. 1992. In 1992, <laughs> and it's black and white. And it's the same things we're saying tomorrow <laughs> that we said 12 years ago, 15 years ago. <laughs> so, um, but so what's. What's changed? Uh, the new guidelines. We've we've we kind of went from just uh, back in the '90s. We didn't have any real protocols. So then then we moved to a protocolized care with the three hour and the six hour bundle, and we've kind of moved away from that now because the criticism of that was. And I'm not saying I agree with or disagree with the criticism, but the criticism is it doesn't give the skilled clinician intensivist typically, um, the ability to modify the care based on the patient. So do we treat that 85-year-old um, demented uh, person from the nursing home with 30 mils per kilogram, the same, and that's the same resuscitation we'd use on a 25-year-old trauma victim that develops an interabdominal sepsis. Mm -hmm. So We've kind of now moved away from the protocolized care with the with the latest guidelines. Um, we still, it's still um, recognition is key. We've moved away from the, the new guidelines, and although I don't think either of us agree with moving away from the SERS criteria, but the new guidelines use something called um, the QSOFA score. Um, which is derived from the SOFA score, which is more of a European model to assess severity of illness and mortality, uh, risk of mortality. So the QSOFA is really three things, um, change of mental status, respiratory rate greater than, I think it's 22, and um, uh, drop in blood pressure. And the data says that that really uh, is a very high predictor of, or uh, very, positive predictor of mortality. Problem is, it's not a screening tool. You can't screen with that. Yeah. So 
but we're still using fluid, all right? It gives a little more discretion to the provider of how much fluid, because if you've got somebody that's in florid pulmonary edema mm -hmm. and septic, you're not going to dump fluid in them. Right, right. Um, or you got somebody with a, I'm not a neuro person, but you got somebody with um, intracranial hemorrhage plus sepsis, you know, you're not going to tank drive the pressure up so high. So we still use fluid, but the new guidelines are give a little more discretion. Although the CMS reporting system still, still makes you deliver 30 mils per kg, and there's no way to opt out of it. So if you don't use 30 mils per kg, you're gonna get dinged. What? At least, at least now. Okay. I think that'll probably change, yeah. um, but at least now you still get dinged. Then it's blood cultures. Uh, or cultures in general, the blood cultures, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I'll give and, you my notes from 92. Okay, <laughs> that's the same thing. The same it's the same thing. And, uh, but we don't use, uh, you know, you can use measures of um, central uh, mixed venous oxygenation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, it's not in the guidelines. Okay. Um, that, that's been removed. Kind of the whole early goal-directed therapy, although it doesn't hurt, it's not in the guidelines, so you know everybody jumped on the early goal directed therapy guidelines, and not everybody. Um, some of us kind of resisted, and sure enough, those have been removed. So the, the, that's a whole separate topic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because the resuscitation in the three major studies that said early goal directed therapy doesn't work already did the yeah. resuscitation. So it's it's a little bit it's a little bit controversial. Yeah, mm. but. I think this well, because we have so little to treat effectively, mm -hmm. the arguments are over really minutia. Give fluids until they're hemodynamically stable, resuscitate them properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how it should be stated. Mm -hmm. Not give two fifty, not give thirty mils per kilo. Resuscitate properly. Yeah, and that's what the new goals, the the new guidelines say is, you know, use rather than um, CVP or very static right. measures, use more dynamic measures of fluid resuscitation, like echo, um, ultrasound, mm -hmm. passive leg raise. That, 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 is my, like, that was my other favorite quote from last year. <laughs> you can have a CVP <laughs> on, a, on a dead guy, but yeah. their, their cardiac output is zero. That's right. And I was like, <laughs> that is so true. I love yeah. that. <laughs> I'm like, really I show that to my graduate me. students. It's easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> I think another one I remember was, I think you don't use a stethoscope or you don't, who doesn't use no, a stethoscope? We joke about that. You, do we actually do use a stethoscope? Not much. <laughs> Not much. Because you use an old, like, portable ultrasound, correct? Yeah, we talk about that tomorrow, too. Yeah, I Actually, I've got an animation <laughs> I want to show you. Okay. Yeah, so we, we got a bunch of new stuff for tomorrow. All right. But, so the, really not much has changed. Right. Uh, it's been tweaked. Yeah. That's what it but is. It's been tweaked. It's, okay. um, and then the, you know, the, the whole uh, Dr. Merrick thing has really kind of just messed everything up. Um, I shouldn't say messed everything up, but it's, it's created a lot of turmoil. Uh, and I think one thing you brought up is, is dead on. Now families read this. They see it on NBC Nightly News, mm -hmm. and they go in, and they're going to say, well, how come you're not using vitamin C? Mm -hmm. And and how do you have that intelligent conversa conversation about evidence based practice right. to a family that is desperate for their loved yeah, one they, to be improved? Yeah. yeah, and that's their response. What's the harm? Right, right. It's just vitamin C, right? Yeah. Like, what's, so you actually went because I was talking about it on Twitter with some people and um, multiple nurses, and I think maybe one physician said that they had already had. Because, you know, sepsis is, so many people have it, so it's, they had already had patients that they had to have that conversation. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know, I, it was hard to, you know, it's hard to have that conversation with the loved ones. It's hard to talk to them about sepsis and make it something they can understand, let alone, and vitamin C seems so simple. Yep. And it's, it's, it puts providers in a very difficult spot. Mm -hmm. To have to defend if they're not going to use it. Right, right. You have to have a very. Good, seems like you'd have to have a very good reason to do it or not. Right. Yeah. There's. You know, Mike said it very well. Is mm. there's no real benefit for a clinician to deny it to a family that asks for it. The risk seems to be low. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe it doesn't work. Okay, I was going to ask you what your thoughts were about it. 
the, the example that I use because I've done several talks on this already, mm -hmm. they'll end up doing a randomized control trial on this and it'll show it won't work. It'll take us three to five years to do that. And then they're going to find a subsection of the group that they think it worked in. They're going to study for another three to five years. That won't work either. So in 10 years from now, we'll say, yeah, but it sounds like it should work. And so you'll still have controversy, just like you do with steroids. Mm -hmm. The uh, steroids have been, they should work. When you look at a pathophysiologist, this should work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. And we've studied it and studied it and studied it. Uh, major trials. But I don't think we've studied it properly. And See, that'll, that's what the answer is. <laughs> we didn't study it properly, so no, I need another no, no, study. Just, just relax. <laughs> Let me finish, would you? Um, I couldn't have said no, that any better. No. We, and this, we talk about this too, the whole precision medicine um, initiative. We, in these studies, we treat everybody as if they have the same genotype. Yeah. And they don't. So maybe there is a subset. And actually there's some, there's some neonatal literature that's very clear that um, it comes out of Cincinnati Children's, that they've been, they've been um, drawing blood on these kids for years and trying to genotypically identify which kids get septic, which kids survive sepsis once they get it, and which kids die. And there's a difference in them mm -hmm. genetically. So the same is true. So we're going to take one treatment and we're going to give it to everybody, regardless of age, race, gender, that's what I mean when it's That's been exactly studied. Right. That oh, he agreed with me. Well, well, no, he didn't bring up genetics. He needed to qualify it. genetics, then I would have agreed. Okay, <laughs> but the idea being is that there's we know so little about sepsis. Mm -hmm. We're throwing everything we can. Does anything work? And so Dr. Merrick said, "Gosh, I think this worked." And then they went to the public with it, which is an anathema to a scientist. And not until I've studied this a yeah. little more, because all these conversations are going to happen. I mean, if I'm a clinician in ICU, I'd probably give it, because I don't know what else to tell the family. Mm -hmm. And at least it looks like you're... And then another family says, why are they getting it? Well, yeah. go ahead and give it then. Yeah, yeah and then all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden, you're giving it to everybody. And then all of a sudden, the drug companies will raise the price. <laughs> yeah, and I'll guarantee you that'll happen. I agree. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it go The orange juice companies. Yeah, my, I, I do eat, drink a lot more orange juice since yeah. the article came out. <laughs> <laughs> Back on you. So, speaking from that perspective of the ICU nurse, let's say we have that septic patient who's not going to make it. Um, how do you, and, and maybe the family doesn't realize it yet, but the clinicians do. How, how do you know when, it's, when, when you're done? Like when, when it's time to say, okay, they're not going to survive this. Oh, I, that's the critical question. We, we don't know. That's the problem. You got to take the patient's history in consideration. You know, do, is it a 90-year-old from a nursing home with dementia? Mm -hmm. well, that's a little bit easier. You know, a 41-year-old man who stepped on a nail and got severe cellulitis, now he comes in with a change in mental status, and he's in multi-organ system dysfunction. We're well, going to try pretty hard on that. Mm -hmm. But if... This is one of the things we talk about with something as simple as procalcitonin. If that level is not coming down by a lot, something's wrong. Uh, this is where we talk about using mixed venous oxygen hemoglobin levels. When you start to see that level go up, that's a horrible sign because mm -hmm. it shows the cells aren't using oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so you start to tell family early on, never surprise them. Show them a number, for example. Show them their FiO2. This number should be better in a couple days. And if it still isn't, they know it's not getting better. Mm -hmm. Do that early on. That's a great point. Don't wait until later and then they're surprised what's going on. Yeah. See this vasopressor? Yeah, you can show it to them. This mm -hmm. is norepinephrine. It's the most powerful drug we've got. This is our last drug. Mm -hmm. If this doesn't help the blood pressure, we have nothing else. So the family's aware of what's happening. You know, then as clinicians, you got to evaluate what is the other, the family or the patient circumstances, what their disease, what's their prognosis. Yeah. But that's a critical conversation to have. And it sounds like we need to be 
proactive very and very can, like sharing the lactate level, sharing Absolutely. the calcitonin so that it's not like a week later and they're, you know, hopeful and it's like we're dropping a bomb. It's like they, yeah. they kind of know. I, absolutely. It's a, it's a process. But, you know, it's, it also, if they're, if they're sick enough to be in the ICU and they're sick enough to, to be in septic shock and then especially start, you know, getting that multi-organ system failure involvement, you know, it's important that the family understand from the get-go that, you know, this is bad and this is, That's you right. know, we, we can try all the things that we can try, but in the end, everybody's, every person's response to infection is a little bit different. So what might work for me might not work for you, might not work for Joe down the street. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is going to be a tough few days and, and go ahead and start with that from the get-go because it's, it can get really bad really fast. That's right. Yeah. And let them know what should get better. They shouldn't be on a breathing machine for a week. If something, they're on a breathing machine for a week, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, not that you're not going to give, or, you know, that you'd give up, but just that the family knows that you're fighting a tough battle here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a skill. I mean, that's a skill set for it is. nurses. It is. It really is. And physicians and providers. And not everybody's good at it. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And, um, in fact, the last IC was at, and, and Tom talks about this, um, we had a nurse hired just to interface with the families. And every ICU should have that, and they should pay them a quarter million dollars a year. <laughs> um, what, what's I'll the join title? you on that. Yeah. <laughs> what is, what's, the t what's the title that nurse has? I, I think she was. A, I think she was the ICU advocate. I think that's what we called it. And there's a couple oh. names. You're right, but that's a good name. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. And she would she would start early, you know. And I I never really got this until I had to go through it with my mother. Um, she was she uh, passed away in an ICU, died of um, ARDS. And I went through it with my father because I knew that she wasn't going to survive. Mm -hmm. And um, so I talked to him at first about DNR and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, in the event that the heart stops. And then I started to talk to him about withdrawal care like a day later. And he said, why would I do that? I still have her. She's still yeah. here. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I never, thought like I never that. thought like that. Right. Like, they can still come and visit. Yeah, that's not what you want. And until I, I really got to my father to say, do you think this is really what she'd want? Mm -hmm. And that's why that that self determination and um, that most form and really getting to know from the family early. Mm -hmm. Like what? What would they want? Do they have any documentation of it? Mm -hmm. And because what we've all said, you can't go through all this for seven days and drop the bomb. We're done. Right. And then expect a decision. Yeah. Let's and let's withdraw. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. Like why it. didn't you tell me this? That's right. Um, yeah. A long time ago. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Like why? Why am I all, all of a sudden feeling like I got different news? But you know what I find is the challenge that I've seen as a nurse too is. I'll have different providers paint a different picture. Yeah, you absolutely will. So I'll, maybe I will have said blank. And then, well, and this isn't a sepsis example, but again, back with neuro, I have the neurosurgeon come in and says something very positive. And then the intensive care doctor paints a very realistic picture. Yes. And then the family doesn't know what to do or how to respond. And then I, I, don't, I don't know what to do because now it looks like I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, mm -hmm. you need to let the family know they may hear different opinions. Well, that's a good way to say that. Because, and again, if at all possible, there should be one advocate. So I like that, that you know, mm -hmm. position. If someone in the family can go to for questions, Dr. So-and-so said this and Dr. So-and-so said this, what am I believe? Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, the nurse advocate could do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really the, the way you kind of help that because you won't eliminate that because the physicians don't talk to each other. Right, yeah. right. That's that's been the challenge. Is like we put a put a sentence in a note, and then maybe I'm with my other patient when they go in to see them, so yeah. I didn't hear it. And then what the family says to me sounds drastically different yeah. than that one sentence in the note. And now, just kind of in some ways, it depends on the type of you're in. Like in a university I see where I am, mm -hmm. we say listen to the intensivist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, I mean, the, they're their main doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, and that's typically what would I think it would boil down to. Yeah. But, okay, so I want to make sure I have time for both of you to jump on a soapbox real quick. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you each... Watch Mike when you say quick. This could be another hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. So one Let minute soapbox. One minute soapbox. Okay, good. You got a one minute, 90 second you soapbox go first. on sepsis to the brand new nurse. Okay, you're going to see this almost every day. Watch out for it. You're going to find people develop sepsis that you don't expect to have it. Uh, the key is always it starts with an infection, real or suspected. Watch that person. Make sure they're not getting worse. Use advanced technology. Get lactates. Get procalcitonins. Use esophageal dopplers or uh, other forms of ultrasound to assess the patient um, to find out, is, are they really in danger? But again, if this patient isn't acting the way they normally are, something's wrong if they have an infection. That was very well stated. It was, Thank and you. I think now you get there on time, so you can Okay. Steal. I always do that for Mike. So, <laughs> um, I, would, I would echo what my fine colleague said, <laughs> but I think uh, trust your gut. Um, you know, you got through nursing school, uh, you've been well-trained, trust your assessment skills, and use them. Um, but also, find your voice. You know, you're, you're the patient advocate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd much rather have a maybe unpleasant conversation with a physician on the other end of the line trying to get somebody up there to see the patient than to tell a patient's family, sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to make that call, and now, you're pay now we got to send your patient or your loved one to the ICU. So um, find your voice. Advocate for patients. Really care. And um, you'll save lives. I mean, you, you will. You, that, that is you, no exaggeration. You will absolutely save lives, but you have to find your voice. And, you know, and this, this gets on you know, one of my social media campaigns, but the whole stop the silence piece. Mm -hmm. um, and if you work in a place that really doesn't allow you to do that, do something else. Mm -hmm. Go someplace else. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I say this to my students, talk with your feet. All right. If it doesn't work, walk. Do something else. Mm -hmm. And and I think we got we got to stop these cultures where nurses can't fully practice to their scope, and really um, be that patient advocate that we've all been trained to do. So mm -hmm. that's what I got. Wonderful. Yes. Any final sepsis? Any kind of thoughts? No. Sepsis. Yeah. Sepsis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep that term. We may steal it. Um, yeah. Cover it. <laughs> right. um, so thank you so much to our guests for being here. Um, nurses, make sure you're advocating, um, recognizing early, um, and having those proactive educational conversations with the family consistently about the state that their loved one is in so that they can make the best decisions possible at every step of the way. So thanks, nurses, and stay fresh. Damn crowd better hit the floor All the other fellas better run for the door Stop, drop, and roll with me I got the heat that'll make you scream